It's time for Windows Weekly episode 132 with Paul Therott. The new office is here. The new office is here. We'll talk all about it. Bing's got some big deals for Black Friday and uh, why Chrome OS could be trouble for Microsoft. It's all coming up next with Windows Weekly. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Windows Weekly is provided by CashFly at C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com. This is Windows Weekly with Paul Therott, episode 132 for November 27th, 2009. Google Bing. Windows Weekly is brought to you by the new voice-activated sync featuring hands-free calling, music search, and turn-by-turn -turn navigation. Available exclusively on Ford, Lincoln, and Mercury vehicles. For more details and to enter to win a free Nano or Zune, visit SyncMyRidePodcast.com. And by Audible.com. To download a free audiobook of your choice, visit Audible.com slash Windows and follow Audible on Twitter at Audible underscore com. And by Go to My PC. Think remote access to your PC is complicated? Think again. It's easy with Go to My PC. For your free 30-day trial, visit go to mypc.com slash Windows. It's time for Windows Weekly, the show that covers all things Microsoft. Not just Windows. Oh, no. We covered the Zoom. <laughs> that's about it. And that's about it's it. It's pretty much Windows and Zoom. Windows and... No, there's other stuff. Um, <laughs> mice? What else do they do? Keyboards? Xbox. 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 How's yeah. modern... Hey, Paul Therott, ladies and gentlemen, here he is. He's looking good in his camo gear <laughs> and his okay. electrically assisted... If I'm, if I'm doing it properly, you can't see me. He's invisible. <laughs> Pretend you don't see him. It'll make him feel better. That's well, right. so you got back from PDC. Paul Therott is the, uh, by the way, the editor of the Win Super Site, Super Site for Windows. He is also uh, the uh, the guy at the uh, news guy at the IT Pro, Windows IT Pro magazine. He's also the author of Windows 7 Secrets, of which there are more than seven, I believe. More than seven secrets. Yes. Sometimes yeah. you might read that title and think, oh, there are, there are seven secrets, and here are seven all seven secrets of secrets of Windows, yeah. In a thousand pages. Mm -hmm. Kind of like yeah. more than you'd ever know, you know, about those seven secrets. But no, in fact, there are probably many thousands of secrets. The version of Windows is reputed to be seven. <laughs> no one really knows. <laughs> so PDC, last uh, final thoughts after a fun week in uh, in uh, wherever you were. San was it San Diego, LA? LA, LA, yeah. I like going to LA. You know, PDC was kind of bland, and I, it's it's sort of a weird thing. You know, Microsoft. Uh, I think I might have mentioned this last week. They're they're pretty proud of the fact that they had the same exact message for Windows 7 this year as they did last year. But I'm not, I don't know. That's not really the point of PDC. Well, you uh, want a new message, otherwise why? why well, it's, all, it's about the new platforms, you know, right. and things like that. So, I, I, you know, Windows 7 still new, so that's okay. But I, I, I think when PDC was a great chance to talk about things like, you know, the next version of Windows Mobile, and they didn't really do any of that. Um, we got some IE stuff that was interesting that we talked about last week, and obviously Office, um, new version of Silverlight and all that. So there, there is certainly stuff going on. And, of course, they launched their cloud platform. But, you know, it's all it's just a state of flux, I guess, is where we're at right now. And did you, uh, did you get one of those uh, Acer uh, computers? <laughs> no, I did not. Okay, just checking. You can say now because Brian's not listening. <clears throat> right. So, no. <laughs> <laughs> Still no. Uh, no. I got a Bing mug. <laughs> Look at that. <clears throat> no, I'm, in fact, one of the things I have to... That's nice, by the way. Yeah. Yeah. I have and, a big sticker. On Xbox my, on 360 my... pens and, nice. and a, a Bing mouse pad. I there Bing, you, you Bing. We all Bing for ice Bing. So, okay, yeah. so I got some some swag. Some swag, yeah. I have some... I'm a PC stickers. <laughs> <laughs> Those are always good. I have some... I'm. It was my idea. Uh, T-shirts. Oh. I don't know if I really want to wear those. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I have a T-shirt. 
That's all you need. I'm glad you're wearing your T-shirt. I don't really go there for the stuff. No. You know? No. I think one of the, the things you realize very early on with trade shows, especially the really big ones like uh, Comdex, which they used to have, or CES, you know, if you want to, you can walk around with a bag and you can put in paperwork from right. every single company on earth, you know. And then, of course, what you have when you're done is a, a suitcase-sized container full of paper that weighs more than you do. Sometimes in the uh, press room, I don't know if they still do this, they used to have, <laughs> you, go, you bring all this crap mm -hmm. and they'd have like a box Mm -hmm. and, and and they'd FedEx it. Like there was a, like a mailing guy oh, set up there. Sure, remember sure, that? Sure. And you, and you well, yeah, all remember your stuff? Condex and CES, you yeah. know, they have um, a mile of bins of press releases in paper right. form, which is astonishing to me. You know, Microsoft uh, handed out paper versions of their press releases this past Why? week. You know, it's just weird, you know. But I, um, More and more I go to these things and then I get a, U, a USB key that's loaded with the uh, stuff. Yeah, yeah, that's what you want. Or just a, an email would be good. The yeah. Zoom USB key they gave us for press materials has, was a four gigger. Yeah, I have um, so many of these now. They're like uh, it's like a chiclet. Or what do you call those things? Uh, like a Pez dispenser. <laughs> yeah, but then I was at another event and they gave me a five hundred twelve megabyte. It was like, come sure. on. Sure. Yeah, they got those for free. The, f <laughs> the four gigger is good because I use that to update my pony car. Four gig. <laughs> Jeez. I do. No, so you know the Ford Sync. You could put. You go to SyncMyRide.com and you plug in. Mm -hmm. you, you you download updates. How come you have to do this, though, in such a fashion? It doesn't have some kind of wireless capability? Uh, you know, it obviously does. I think it's Microsoft's spot, though. Uh, you know, I'd love to know this. You you would be the guy who would know. Because, it's you know, it's it's synced by Microsoft. Yeah. And it gets traffic, sports scores and stuff. But I think it's, I'm guessing it's spot, which isn't super fast. Certainly not fast enough to uh, download large updates. So you go get those on the web and then it has a USB port in the car. <laughs> it's really sure. funny. I'm updating my car's firmware. <laughs> I love that. I hope that thing doesn't crash. You know. I know, really. Pardon the Blue pun. Screen of death. <laughs> uh, no, it's kind of it's kind of cool that way. But that's what I use the. Uh, I figure you know it's a Zune, it's a Sync, yeah. it's kind of the same puppy, so to speak. <laughs> so you know, let me as long as we we start talking about Sync, let me talk about Sync a little bit, and then we can uh, okay. get to the stories at hand. How's the modern warfare doing? Pretty good. We get there. You know, one of my friends had the temerity <laughs> to pull ahead of me in the standings while I was gone. Son you of know, a gun. To abuse the amount of time that I could not be playing. Son of a gun. So today the word comeuppance is going to occur. <laughs> I got the um, the iPod or the iPhone game, the zombies, Call of Duty zombies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's And that's amazingly faithful to the... You know, the PC or Xbox version, right? It's too scary for me. It's too scary. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, that's actually the biggest, maybe the biggest failing of Modern Warfare 2 is that there are no zombies. Oh, bring on the zombies. Those guys just keep on coming. I think they make sense in a po post-apocalyptic world. <laughs> you know? Do you think this would be good training uh, for playing Modern Warfare 2? Because I really do want to work my the, way the, up. <laughs> the iPod version or whatever? Yeah, the iPod. Um, um, no, no, I do not. No. It will give you a look at the graphics, though. I, I mean, again, the one thing I'm really amazed by is how good-looking this game is. I guess I shouldn't be. You know, games like Doom Resurrection yeah, they can or, do this um, now. you know, whatever. I mean, there's some good-looking games on this system. It's pretty impressive. I can do this now. It's good enough to scare the heck out of me. Look, here comes a zombie. <gasps> oh! Yeah. That, that, by the way, what you just played there, you, you played an intro to the game, right? Yeah, and this is, right. this is something that is happening more and more often on these iPod iPhone games, right? There's yeah. a a short uh, movie. video yeah. at the beginning, and yeah. it's literally a movie. It is. It plays. You see the QuickTime using player the iPod probably. software. You see the yep. the controls. You can pause it and 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 uh, you know get rid of it, obviously. But it seems like a lot of games are now taking advantage of that, and it's uh, at least you can skip over it. Yeah. Oh, you don't right. like it, but it's a cutscene, isn't well, that? Isn't it's that... cute. I think the first time is neat. Um, I think after that you should, you know, have to ask for it to see it. It's it's cutting down on the you know, the actual gameplay, right? So I get this chalk really, rifle. Uh, the right graphics here. are incredibly faithful. It, yeah, I mean, it looks good. How do I get the chalk rifle? Oh, I press the get. Oh, look at that. <laughs> oh, man, now I'm ready. Oh, yeah. Come on, zombie. Come on, come and get me. Hmm. Oh, I'm sorry. Are we doing a show? Let me uh, mention Fort Sink. <laughs> I mentioned Fort Sink lately. <laughs> do, you, do you play that game while you're driving? <laughs> you can, pretty much. That's one thing the Ford Sync doesn't have. It would be kind of cool if they did. They would have, if they had a, uh, you know, a game. But it would, but see, the whole point of Sync is 
that you don't take your eyes it's, off the road. It's meant to be safer, right? It's and you don't off. take your hands off the wheel. But that, mm -hmm. but but see, if you think about it, what it uh, what it does is you could do a verbal game. Oh like, yeah, and plus, like Samantha, the woman in the sink uh, voice, could say, "They're coming for you. What would you like <laughs> me to do? Shoot. Okay. Shoot again. <laughs> okay." It, uh, the the steering wheel would be an ideal place for joystick controls. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm not Just going that far. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you joke, you jest. But, you know, obviously know, there are yeah. some hardcore Call of Duty folk who would absolutely do this that. if they could. Anyway, go to Sync My Ride podcast. You can find out about the amazing hands-free. Take your hand, keep your hand on the wheel. Keep your eye on the road. Ford Sync. With calling, of course, even uh, even nine one one. Should you run into something, music search it automatically calls nine one one and tells them where you are. Airbags have been deployed. Turn by turn navigation, even without the navigation, uh, you know, screen, it talks you through everything. You could say, you could say, play Windows Weekly. It would play Windows Weekly. I love the vehicle health report. You just press a button, uh, you know, and say vehicle health report, and it sends you. You know, a message on your phone saying, okay, I got the report. And then you go to the website, and there it is. Everything going on with your car. Personalized news, sports, and weather, and traffic reports. You can learn more about Sync by going to SyncMyRidePodcast.com. There it is, SyncMyRidePodcast.com. And uh, the instructions there on how to uh, tweet to win. You tweet, uh, say something like, you know, I love Paul Therat. I love Modern Warfare. And I really want to win a free Nano or free Zoom pound Sync My Ride Podcast. That's the hashtag. And when you do that on your Twitter Ford's going to sit up and take notice. They're going to say, okay, this one's got to win. This one's a winner. And they'll put you in the drawing for one of free, 15 free nanos or zooms. They're kind of showing up, demonstrating the fact that it works on a nano or zoom, see? Or anything with a USB cable, really. As long as you've got MP3s on there that are tagged, you can, it can sync them up and you can call for them by name. I just love it. Go to Sync My Ride Podcast or get in the drawing to win. A free Zune or Nano. We thank Ford for supporting the show. We really do. And that's a Microsoft product, so it fits. So you don't know if it's, I mean, it's. I, I figure it's Windows CE in there. Yeah, it's got to be. Yeah. I don't know about that. You were, you were talking about Is it spot? The, uh, the spot thing. Yeah. yeah. So it, it could use the same technology. But I mean, that was really designed for those extremely small micro computing devices that would fit inside a watch and so forth. So, I mean, I, obviously, I in guess. the size of a stereo, you could have something more sophisticated than Absolutely. that. Absolutely, yeah. But if nice. you think of, you know, an iPod Touch or a, a typical Windows mobile phone or whatever, anything like that, you know, these devices are capable of playing back, you know, H.264 video. They can play any audio format. It's pretty sophisticated computing capabilities in there. So something that device, uh, that size, would fit inside of a, a car pretty easily, you know. So I, I assume it's. But, I, but like I'm, I, I'm sure it's a sophisticated computer. I'm just wondering about the uh, about the, the wireless. Technology. I mean, how yeah, is yeah. that? Because it's get, it's definitely getting data. I mean, it knows weather. It knows sure. Oh, there's a GPS in there. It's a GPS. So yeah, uh, yeah. I don't know. It uses it's, your what? phone for the 911. It uses your Bluetooth. So it use, yeah, it uses yours. Yeah. So well, it may not have I'm that. Just curious. Capability. It seems like if you can get online with a 3G connection. Oh, maybe it, it uses have... your 3G. No. I don't no, think it does think it because does. you can't guarantee. Right. No, uh, that you have that sort of capability, and how would it interact with all the different devices? Right. Seems like it should, though, doesn't it? That's always been the goal for me. You know, you put an iPod or something out in the car, or you don't need an iPod in the car because you have this. Right. And, and you have your home mu music collection in the house. Right. It should be syncing. They showed know. something like that at CES years ago, I remember, with the Wi-Fi. You'd park in the garage, and it would yep. do that. This is the clear way. They it never. Needs to be. I don't think they ever implemented that. That my car has a hard drive in it. Not all the sync vehicles do, but my car has a hard drive in it. So but does I, it let you download uh, content from your devices? Is that how that works? No, so but if your it. device, it, see your device, you have full access to. Yeah. It's, so that's no, not. But it the might issue. be nice just to have it in there. You know, if if all you're doing is playing music, it does. It indexes everything on your device so that you can play it. You know, it has, and then if you have a screen, as I do, you have like all the controls. You even can look through your playlists and all that stuff. It's just like the iPod. Or the Zoom interface is now on the screen. Now, right. Sync doesn't require a screen, so you can do it by voice, too. But I'm, I'm just saying, if you bring in a CD, you can rip it to the car's hard drive. Oh, so you well, can rip all your CDs, and then it's on the hard drive. I'd rather have done that back at the computer. and just Syncing you know. would be better. Wi-Fi syncing. I think that's probably just a minor upgrade. The funny thing is, I know they had it because they showed it. Microsoft showed it years ago. 
I don't know why they never implemented it. Maybe people don't park in their garage. Do you park in your garage? No, I don't. But Does your Wi-Fi get to where you park? Mm. Mine's no. kind of like, eh. No. It's yeah, not, it's see, right. I bet you that's what happened. They realize that people don't. I mean, years ago, I I sort of imagined putting a Wi-Fi repeater out in the garage or something like that, right, to get it out to the street. Um, I don't know. It just seems like this should just work, you know. <laughs> I, I wonder if part of it is the, a reluctance on the part of audio manufacturers to embrace Microsoft stuff in the same way that the cable industry has resisted them, right? Because Ford is the only company that has this system. It's true. I was talking with somebody uh, yesterday about the Xbox. Mm -hmm. I remember when we were doing cable TV at, at uh, Tech TV that Microsoft really wanted cable companies to to use Microsoft set top boxes instead of General Instruments. Or yeah. uh, oh, you know, and by the way, the stuff Motorola. they make is fantastic too. But you know why they don't? I I found out. I asked the cable guys. They said, "Yeah, it's great. It's fantastic. It's super smart. It costs way too much." Oh, I see. Because they're putting yeah. so much smarts in it. You know, the time is times have changed, but you know, I know back in the day, it'd be cheaper ago, now. Yeah, they were scared to death of Microsoft, and too. that might have been something. That might have been the. But I mean, I so what does Microsoft that, do? They make the yeah. Xbox 360, which is guess what, a set top box. Sure, I could play Netflix on it. I can stream yeah. Pandora. I can do anything on it now. I love that. Can you play Twit on it? You can, or you will soon. Ooh, never mind. I don't know. <laughs> it could be. Maybe. Perhaps. Because I think that would unlock the hidden potential of the Xbox. <laughs> <laughs> we'll talk about such a device in a little bit. But first, I want to talk about, I want to go, I want to follow your outline, Paul. Because well, I know you put a lot of thought into this. I spent at least 15 minutes on this this morning, at least. But I just thought, Actually. I thought, I was, I, was, I was saying, you know, the set-top box, this Xbox really was the stealth set-top box because Microsoft couldn't get the cable companies to do it. Well, it was so stealth, uh, I mean... <laughs> You know, it, it took years of improvements to get it to the point where, A, it was stable and uh, quiet enough, you know, that you could actually put it in right. the living room. So, yeah, the I, new I one, I got, I got a new one. I got the arcade, as you recommended, much <clears> quieter. But you still, you know, the thing is, you still don't want to put that in a, if you have a recessed home theater compartment no, in your be wall, too hot, be too hot. you can't really put it in there, yeah. you know. It will cook everything else, but it will kill itself, too. It's like uh, going into Harry Carey down there or something. Yeah. It's, it's dangerous you know they're so warm ps3 is like that too when i first got my ps3 i used um they have seti at home you know searching for mm -hmm. extraterrestrials mm -hmm. and the thing would leave it on and it got so hot it was like what the hell it's like an oven i would open up the tv cabinet yeah, yeah, and it was yeah. like <laughs> oh my god i'm yeah. baking my tv <laughs> so i had to stop doing that I had to stop it's actually doing. a brown burn on the back of the hey related wall. to that did you see that <laughs> ibm is going to kill the cell processor there's no new generation that's it no, I didn't because IBM is so thoroughly uninteresting to me <laughs> that I, I I did not see that. But well, here's um, why it's important because that's what's okay. running the PS3, and that's the right. competition to your beloved Xbox. 360. Yeah. So <clears throat> if you look at the Xbox 360, it has no technological um, similarities at all between itself and the original Xbox. No. Right? It's power. If you look at the PS3, so it's, it's dual power PC same chips, thing. right? Right. So the way that Sony originally arrived at some form of backwards compatibility is they literally put a PS2 on a chip inside of the device to play the old it's games. Now they don't even have that anymore. It's em it was an emulator. So that's yeah, they have emulation wow. now. So uh, I think that's the way video games are going. So that whenever there is a future version of the Xbox 360 or the PS4 or whatever they call it or, or the next Nintendo, you know, they don't really... They, there's no... Uh, sense of continuation as there is say on the PC uh, and there doesn't really need to be so uh, the fact that you know they've gotten rid of the cell processor I guess you know maybe they weren't going to use you know that anyway who knows you know Microsoft went in a very strange direction with the Xbox 360 yeah, I would expect power PC chip yeah yeah and now you have to think they're not going power PC next time right no because that's <laughs> also an tips. IBM product yeah, the first version had like a Pentium 3, if I'm not mistaken. Um, the Xbox? I didn't know that. Yeah, I think oh. so. You want, if you're Microsoft, you want to make the Xbox as close as you can to a Windows computer, right? Because then development is I, simpler. I would think so, yeah. yeah. And that's sort of what, what they went with on the first one. You know, and even the Sega Dreamcast. Uh, oh, yeah. That was, that was Windows CE. It was Windows CE, that's yeah. right. And the, the hope was that 
you know, we have this kind of weird other environment and maybe people will do something with it. And of course they never did in that case, but yeah, I don't know. Let's talk about uh, office 2010. Cause that's your first item on your agenda. <laughs> okay. All righty. Can I, ins can I install it now? Is it ready to go? Yeah, it is. It it's, is. And it's an open beta, public beta. It is. And, and since they've released the public beta, they've released more versions of it. So actually that's my software pick this week is a, a new version of office 2010 that's available. But you know, this thing is super stable. It works great. Um, the only minor issues you may have with it might be around add-ins, you know, especially in Outlook. If you have, if you load uh, uh, any kind of add-ins into Office, there may be incompatibilities there, um, as you might expect. But, you know, I've been using Office 2010 since the summer, and I've moved along through various builds over the past few months and uh, now to the beta, and it, it's fantastic. And it's the type of thing where, you know, it's not, a, it's not necessarily a huge evolutionary leap over the previous version, except in some uh, particular cases, especially Outlook. But it's just one of those things where they've really fine-tuned it, and it's, it's great, and uh, it's fantastic. You know, and, and uh, one of the, the new versions that's come to light is this thing called Office Starter, and they're, they're going to replace Microsoft Works with this. And really? uh, God knows. Yeah, God knows how it works. Lasted as long as it did, but uh, Office Starter. I don't remember if it's free or just incredibly inexpensive. But it will only be provided with new PCs. You can't go out and buy this thing. Oh, so finally, when somebody calls up and said, "Oh, I got Microsoft Word. I got Office with my PC," we could say, "Yeah, yeah, yeah." You yeah. don't have to say you they, did not. They might actually have gotten it. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, it's only Word and Excel, and it's sort of stripped down versions of Word and Excel. Although interestingly, I've been using this thing for a few weeks now, and uh, I. Mostly a word user, obviously, do a lot of writing. But aside from the fact that it doesn't do reviewing, which is that multi-authoring capability where you can go in and make edits and you, people can see the edits and uh, approve them or deny them and so forth. Um, in my, for my day-to-day -day work, um, it has all the functionality you would want. And it, it's, it's funny because it looks more like Office 2007 in that it has that kind of bland blue. It's got the ribbon. Uh, yeah, it's got the ribbon, you know, so it's got that full experience. And it's kind of like a, a stepping point into the full office experience, if you will. It has a, a way inside of it to buy a higher-end office version. So you can go well, in it'd and... It would be nice if they gave this away. Yeah. I mean, in a way, they're giving away quite a bit of it with the, with the online version, right? We think they're going to give that away, right? You know, again, I, I don't run the show, obviously, over there. But if I did, um, I would want this and the web version to be functionally identical. Right. Right. I mean, this is what... This is sort of what it should be. Right. I, you know, we may be heading, and I, we're going to talk about Chrome OS a little while. Um, when you look at things like Google Docs, you know, for the Office stuff and the various other competitors they have, and then you look on the OS side of things like Chrome OS or whatever, where you basically have competitors that are coming in at a really free price point. And, and unlike, say, with Linux or OpenOffice or whatever, for whatever reason, as we move forward into sort of a cloud computing future, these things are starting to become interesting to people. I think that the positive effect it may have for consumers ultimately, even if we never switch to this Google stuff, is that it will force Microsoft to rethink their pricing and uh, availability right. strategies, right? right. right. So right. something like Office Starter, yeah, they should just give it away. It seems you know? to me like, I mean, this is that whole um, freemium, uh, yeah. you know, uh, Chris Anderson's free conception where, I mean, you give away free stuff as a come on, to right. the stuff that you make money on. It has, you know, it has a little uh, ad in the corner. Uh, there's a, a task pane on the right side of the window uh, that you can't remove, which is vaguely irritating to me, but I don't think most people would have a problem with it. It has links to different things about learning how to use the product, but it also has an ad. And the ads right now are all for Office 2010. So, you know, during the beta, no big deal. But I guess we'll see how that goes over time. But these things, uh, you know, they seem to work really well. And... Um, yeah, I think it's enough. It's funny to me that I can use something like this, and it's fine. You know, I've looked at Microsoft Works, and of course I can't use anything. You know, Microsoft Works is no, no. almost ludicrous. So if I download the beta, how long is this going to work for? You know, I don't know that, actually. We're just going to get it. You get Word, PowerPoint, Outlook, Excel, OneNote, Access. In the business so are, version, you get yeah, Access so there are, Publisher. There are two versions of uh, that are publicly available, right? Mm -hmm. The one that you're looking at is the... What's called the uh, the professional professional plus, I think. Plus. Right, so it's yeah. got a, it's basically everything. This is kind right. of a, the high end version. And then there's they used to have something called the, Office Ultimate. Then there's Home, Small Business, and School version. 
which is just Word, Excel, PowerPoint, OneNote, yeah. uh, Outlook, Publisher. But here's so here's sense. what's interesting though. They they've added a, this was my actually my software pick of the week this week is something called let me find it. It's Office Home and Business Beta. And this is basically the next step up from Home and Student, right? So Home and Student has Word, Excel, OneNote, and PowerPoint. But Home and Business adds Microsoft Outlook, right, which makes some sense. So right. Small businesses, home businesses, et cetera. Um, the reason this is interesting during the beta is that it's also the vehicle by which Microsoft is testing another new Office feature called Click to Run. And, and the version of Office 2010 Home and Business that you download from Microsoft.com has... Uh, it comes in this virtual package. Huh. So it's actually using application virtualization technology or AppV. This is that uh, streaming thing they've been talking about. Yeah, so what, what it does is it starts streaming down to your desktop. You can run one of the applications within just a few minutes. And <laughs> oh, as you're doing that, it, yeah, it downloads the rest. So the reason they do this is because in the past, people would go to office.com, you know, millions of people every year. They would draw, download trial versions of the software. But then you'd have to wait for the whole thing to download. So 450 megabytes, 500 megabytes, whatever it was, you know, this would take some amount of time. And once it was downloaded to your PC, you would then have to run an installer, right? And you'd set right, it up. And right. if you already had some version of Office on there, there were conflicts between Office versions uh, that date back for, you know, a decade now and all kinds of different issues that could occur. But the thing that's interesting about this click to run thing is that it, you can have anything on your computer. It doesn't matter. You could have an old version of Office, whatever. Because this thing runs completely isolated, from the rest of the system, you can install it side by side with your existing Office version and not have to worry about uninstalling the old one or, uh, you know, whatever kind of incompatibilities you may have. Plus, you can get going with it pretty quickly. Microsoft.com so slash Office slash 2010. I've, I, I can't wait to try this. Yeah, yeah, it's cool. Now, I, I'm know, told I, in the chat room that it expires on Halloween next year. So you get a good, you know, get almost a year out of it. That's yeah, so the good. full version of Office 2010 will be shipping sometime in the first half of next year. So th th it looks like this beta expires then after that happens. So um, you're good to go at least through the final. Do you day. think this is Microsoft's alternative to free? Is like free for the first year? No, I mean, I, I think once Office 2010 is available in final form, they won't have this kind of a giveaway. But what they're doing is making it easier to get it. So, you know, you run. I run into this sometimes. I'm on the road. Uh, my wife, uh, this happened to my wife on the Mac. I reinstalled her Mac and took it on a trip. And then she said, I can't find Word. And I had forgotten to install it. And, um, you know, I keep stuff up on a server. But for, for other people, it would be nice if you would purchase this thing electronically. If you ne ever needed to go back and get it again. Right. Then you, you can download it anytime. Yeah. You don't have to worry about the disks. Do they not uh, expire the download? Because I know sometimes they do that where you can download it. But after a month or so, you can't get it anymore. Yeah, that that could definitely happen. I hate it when beta. that happens. Sure. Well, this is just a beta, right? So right now they're testing the product, and they're also testing some of the technologies is it around. Pretty reliable. Yeah, it's fantastic. I'm I'm gonna get it. I'm kind of sad I installed yeah. 2007. <laughs> well, it's funny. I I have the Office 2010 beta, but then I separately have the Office 2010 starter beta right. running in a virtual environment. And it's funny because now that one comes up. Uh, if I ever click on a Word document, I get the starter version. Oh, I hate that. I, uh, I hate no, but that. it's okay. You know, it, 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 the truth is, when I'm not working on a book, this is all I need. It actually is fine. Somebody told me that don't install it if you're using Outlook in 2007. Is that right? Well, there are, you're right. So there can be incompatibilities. It's funny. Uh, I think we uh, talked about this somewhere, but and maybe, since then. Maybe we talked about it, yeah. I can't remember how it came up, but. Maybe uh, there's somebody who told me that. Maybe. Yeah, <laughs> maybe someone. <laughs> Someone named Paul. Named Paul. <laughs> yeah. um, historically, there have been incompatibilities between different versions of Outlook. Um, so, yeah, my advice has always been to just um, either not install Outlook on the new one or uninstall it on the old one. I have heard from some people who have gotten it to work. I, I have myself experienced huge in incompatibilities between Office 2007, I'm sorry, Outlook 2007 and Outlook 2010 on different machines. So now I don't actually uh, install both. But... Um, I guess some people have made it work, so I guess you can go for it if you want. But uh, but that's a, that's something to be aware. Of. Yeah, it, although you know a click to run version, you shouldn't have any issues. So if you, uh, you know, I don't understand that. So it installs it kind of in a virtualization, or it's just yeah, know. it's virtualized. So it's completely sandboxed. That's bizarre. Yeah. Well, this is a 
kind of an end user version of what they do on the server, right? With their application virtualization technology, it's the same technology, uh, but now they're you know sending it out to individuals, which makes it really interesting. Oh, it's really intriguing. So you're yeah. run, you are running it locally, but you're running it locally in some sort of sandbox. Yeah. So wow. you are you're a Mac user. You'll appreciate the fact that a lot of times on the Mac, you can take this thing. I think they call it a package, an application yes, package. Yes. Right. You drag it over to the application folder. And you've got this one icon that you can double click and it runs the program. That's, That's right. typically or often how applications are deployed on the Mac. That's right. Now, you can actually right click that thing, I think, and say something like open package contents, package contents yep. or something like yep. that. Yeah. So that thing actually has stuff in it. And you it's can go basically and a glorified folder, is what it is. Right. But because of the way that the system works, you know, it's not spewing files all over your file system, usually, right? That's usually how it works in the Mac. So this is sort of like that, but it also takes it to the next level because you can do things like run these things side by side. It is, in fact, virtualized, right? So it's not actually hitting uh, anything on your uh, local system. I and, love this. That's yeah, great. And, uh, you know, this is maybe slightly controversial for some people, but there's no sense of updating with this thing. So if you uh, install Office locally normally, right, one of the things you can do is go to Windows Update, refresh. There might be updates for Office in there. With the packaged versions of Office 2010, these things are automatically updated. You don't really have a choice. Kidding. They're just going to be updated for you. That's intriguing. And in that way, it is like a managed corporate yeah. application right? because someone else is handling it for you. Now, right. some people aren't going to like that. I, I, I get that, I guess. But I think this is a great way to do it. And sort of generally, we've talked in the past about how the future of application compatibility, the future of application deployment in many ways, is this virtualized sandboxed environment type thing and obviously there are third-party tools that let you do things like this i know steve gibson talks about various ways oh, to yeah. sandbox applications oh, yeah. and all that yep. so this is an interesting thing because it's not so much about backwards compatibility in this case obviously it runs on only the newest versions of windows but it does isolate this thing from the rest of your system so that if there's an issue in either it doesn't affect the other it's interesting it says that if, if your system supports Office 2007, it'll support Office 2010. Yeah. It does use graphics acceleration. This mm -hmm. is, I'm really, I'm yeah, very intrigued. Never know. This thing runs like a native application. I'm no... very intrigued by this. Well, it is yeah. running kind of natively, isn't it? I mean, it's just sure. sandboxed. Yep. Wow. This is, this is really interesting. Well, you know, it's the next level. So, Things like XP mode, where you have this kind of weird XP window running under Windows 7. It's cool because you got that application to work. But ultimately, what you want is totally seamless, right? It should look and act and work and be just like it would be natively. And the goal should always be to just make it as seamless as possible. So if it's an individual downloading it at home or, or someone who is at work and just needs some application to get their job done, they should never have to navigate between different interfaces and trying to figure out, well, this is here and this is there and... And all that stuff. So it's, it, this is another, you know, just another step down the road. I think it's, it's really, really interesting that they're doing it with something as high profile and widely distributed as, as Office, right? I mean, this is going to go out to millions of people. I am, I am really intrigued. This is very, this is more innovative than I realized. Yeah, this, right. And that's the thing. I, I, when I was writing, I'm writing a an Office 2010 beta review over time. And I never actually intended to cover this separately. I mentioned it in a, in a preview. Um, I, I figured it would just come up from time to time. But the more I looked at it, the more I realized, yeah, there's way more going on here. It's really yeah, kind of interesting. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I'm, 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 I'm kind of, I'm getting a little <laughs> chill. <laughs> All right, settle down. Is it, is, uh, is it click to install for all versions or is it just for the new uh, home I believe business. it's just home and business, but I could be wrong about that. So that's that. the one it's you a... want to get if you want to try this technology out. Yeah, I could be wrong. I haven't looked Let at what look. the, how yeah, they do the. They only stuff. say click to install on that particular page. Okay. Yeah, I so, thought that. I thought that that was the case, but yeah, yeah, da yeah. Downloading the Office Professional Plus 2010 beta could take an hour or more. Sure. sure. So that's it's an old old school. Yeah, it's the way it always. Now, was. do you is activation somehow different? I guess it. So right now we can't really say uh, in this version there's no activation occurring. Um, I don't know. The other question I have, and Microsoft hasn't commented on this, is when you look at something like Office uh, Student and Teacher or whatever they're calling Home and Student, 
uh, you can install this thing on three different PCs, which is awesome. Now, home and business, you would think, well, are we going to have the same three PC installation option? And they, uh, they are not saying yet. So hopefully that, too, will be the case. Now, you also said there's an office to go. There's a USB key version. Yeah, so inside of, and again, this is one of those things, I'm not sure how many different versions this is going to be made available in, but inside the starter version, uh, you can go in and, and say, I want to install this to a USB key. And then you can bring this key around and you can plug it into a PC. And again, you're running Office virtualized in its own environment off of the key. Now, this has some interesting ramifications, right, around such things as activation and how many times you can run one version of Office on, in different places and so forth. And again, you know, we're in the beta. I don't actually know right now how this is going to work. But it, it's hard for me to imagine that you would buy some high-end version of Office 2010 and that they would allow you to do this on multiple machines simultaneously. So I have to think this will either be limited to certain versions of Office or will be, in fact, limited in some way. So, for example, I know on uh, Mac versions of Office, it actually looks on the local network to see how many machines are running with the same key. And if there's too many, it won't work anymore. Right. Or yeah, I think doesn't. that's a fairly decent system because then if you've got a laptop and you mm -hmm. install it on your laptop and you're on the road, you're not using it at the office, it's, it works because you're on a different network at that point. Yeah. I think that's a, that's a fair solution. They don't want sure. one. We will see. I don't want to. I don't want to say that's what they're doing. Right. I don't know. So that's the worst kind of piracy. I would. I would guess is one office buys one copy of Office and it's yes, exactly. on every it's machine. Yeah, yeah. You know that's <laughs> that's the one I presume that they're. I, I they're think fighting. that the software protection schemes have gotten sophisticated enough to prevent that kind of thing. I think for you know yeah. going forward, but one would hope. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Windows Home Server. Are you when you say you install, you keep your installs uh, available? Is that where you keep it on your Windows Home Server? Yes. Interesting. That's a great idea. Yeah. yeah. I love home server and, uh, you know, I use it and it is the foundation now of my home network and so forth. Uh, there's a PowerPack 3 release that was just delivered, a free update for everyone who has Windows home server. Presumably the last update, the last update of its kind for this version of home server, right? Because they're working on a new version that's based on the latest version of server and so forth and will hopefully still happen sometime next year. But this is primarily about Windows 7 integration pieces. And it's just a lot of automated stuff that you could actually do most of this before, but it just kind of autom automates it. So, for example, uh, Windows 7 has libraries. And if you install the connector software, your file uh, folders up on the server are automatically added to the correct libraries in Windows 7. So you have a music library. There's a music share up on the server. That music share is added to the music library automatically. You can remove it, of course. Um, and in the past, before uh, PowerPack 3, you could do this yourself manually, right? You could go into libraries, into the music library, add a location, navigate to that folder, and just add it. So this was always available, but now they've, they've just sort of automated it. Uh, they've added um, some backup and recovery pieces. So one of the little nagging things you do get in Windows 7 today is, hey, don't forget to do a backup. You know, hey, don't forget to do a backup. Hey, don't forget to do a backup. So... If you're using Windows Home Server's backup instead of Windows 7's, because it's superior, uh, Windows 7 backup turns itself off. It won't nag you anymore. You know, that kind of thing. So just a bunch of little things that make uh, Windows 7 integrate better with Windows Home Server. And uh, when you use Windows Home Server, does it show up? You map? Do you have to map it, or does it map automatically? Well, I so, presume you're mapping it so that you can do the installs, right? I mean, how do you? I guess it doesn't I mean, matter. Oh, I'm sorry. You, you mean just have a share? Do you map the? Yeah. Do yeah, you map so, the letters? Yeah. Let me look at what I have here. So on my on yeah, my sure home server, can. there are there are different shares that they've created for you. You can create your own shares. Uh, among them are such things as music, photos, recorded TV, software, users, and videos. So under users, I keep all of my important data under the you know under Paul or whatever. Under software, Windows Home Server installs things like the, uh, the Home Server connector software that you need to connect clients to Home Server. But I've created folders under there for applications, drivers, uh, different OS versions, and so forth. So I, I have put everything that I need to install up That's on the great. server. That's great. Yeah. And then you don't need, you don't mount it. You, I mean, you, I guess you mount no, it. No, I don't mount it. it. I just it all the time. Yeah. 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 Very clever. 
You're a clever man, Paul Thorat. Don't anybody tell you any different? <laughs> oh, okay. I, it's not that clever, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I mean, and this has nothing to do with netbooks, so this is good for netbooks as well because they don't have optical drives. You know, one of the big pains in the butt previously would be those applications that came on DVDs that I would have to install. So yes. things like Photoshop, yes. Office, um, what else? Uh, Visual Studio, you know, things like that. Uh, require an optical disc. You know, those things tend to take a little bit longer. You know, you may be around the house or whatever, and you have to go dig the thing. It's it's nice just to have everything centralized. Uh, it's just a simple system. Right, right. I agree. Uh, I always plan on doing that with, uh, you know, my, my uh, NAS drives. But yeah. I think it's probably a little bit easier with a Windows Home Server. Sure. Windows, you know, Windows Home Server does a lot of other things as well, right? Remote access right. and... Right. It also does uh, data duplication, which is uh, huge. And you can have add-ons that will uh, move your backups off-site, which is also of use if your house... Oh, to... really? Oh, that's neat. Like with Jungle Disk or Carbonite or, I mean, what? Is it... Jungle when... Disk. Jungle Disk, yeah. Yeah, and in the case of HP, HP also supplies a HP-branded uh, S3 compatible backup cool. solution. Of their that's own. cool. So last night... Mm -hmm. I had a little extra time, so I installed Chrome OS. I just thought I'd play around with it. Yeah. Did you? Well, How did you do that? There is a guy on Twitter. Yeah, I, I heard there is a guy on Twitter. Yeah, and um, actually there's quite a few, but uh, and Gadget pointed me to this, who yeah. has made a uh, disk image right. that you right. can uh, then put on a USB key with you know the Windows imager. Um, actually, it works with Send me this, please. I'd like to see this. Yeah, I'll send you the link. Um, and... Um, What's, uh, let me see if I can find his name on twit on the Twitter. Uh, it's like it's something weird. It's like the Hexen, Hexa, 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 with Des, Hexa, Vesa, Decimal. Nope, it is Hexen. It would be funny. Remember that game? That was a fun I game. That. I loved that game. It was a fun game. Um, but so you, you, it, it's an image that he made. H uh, e x x e h is his Twitter handle. Okay. Heck. heck Hexa, H E X X E H, and uh, and uh, I think on his website there's a well no actually it's in his tweets there's a link to uh, his website which is carbon yep dot hexa H E X X E H dot net slash chromium os and he has a BitTorrent there that you can download of um, the image which works. Well, I mean, it's just an image, and then instructions sure. for how to zip it onto a um, USB key. So I did that. Yep. Uh, yeah. And worked fine. I uh, put it in my MSI Wind and booted to the USB key. Then right. I got stuck. <laughs> okay. And I'll tell you why I got stuck. Now, this can only run on a physical machine. Is that how this works? It's a. Uh... It's not for virtualization. There are other. There are. You know, you can get oh. a, a VMware image. Yeah, I figured there would be a lot of stuff like that. Yeah, and that's probably the easiest way to do it, but mm -hmm. it's not going to give you all the speed. So this is this runs natively. Now, okay. uh, and 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 in, if you go to the Chromium OS <clears throat> wiki, they have machines that it's known to work with. The, it seems like the one that's the best, the one yeah. uh, that uh, Matt Cutts said he got it working on very easily, is the uh, C shell, the one thousand eight H A Asus EPC. Oh, a classic. Asus. Oh, it's beautiful though. EPC. That's the that's the new thin one, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, and you just put it on there, and it works. The Wi-Fi works. Uh, everything works apparently. Now, for for me, and I still haven't figured out why. You know, the first thing I see is Chromium, beautiful. Log mm -hmm. in. So I don't know. What You're like, well, yeah, what's the login? <laughs> log in. So I figured, oh, well, I'll give it... log on to your Gmail account? Well, you that's must. what I thought. But the problem is, yeah. so I did. I give it my Google credentials. But the problem is it's not online because I haven't, uh, I haven't gotten on the boot of the operating. I mean, I haven't configured the chicken, it. chicken, chicken and egg. It's, it's a chicken thing. and egg kind of a thing. Gotcha. Gotcha. So I, I'm going to try it today. This would, un, uh, in some people, have unleashed a Google doesn't get it editorial. No, 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 no. no. Because we're, no, <laughs> you know? we're, this is like, this is not even out until yeah. September of next year. Sure. This is like pre completely pre-release. But you're yeah. right. Some people would have written, You see, I told you a network I operating system would exactly. work. Uh, yeah. In fact, I yeah. Twittered it. I said, um, anybody know, is there a default? You know, like a magic admin password that I can get into, so I can configure the 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 wire yeah. the network, so that I can then get into it. And everybody said, "Just use your Google credentials." 
That is the solution. And then somebody's no, it isn't. And then somebody said, it? it's a network operating system, not very useful, not on the network. Well, I said, well, yeah, but you got to get it on the network first. <laughs> so I'm going to plug it into no, an Ethernet. Uh, I connect. swear to God, if, if we were to somehow magically be able to remove all of the noise from the Internet, <laughs> you would just hear crickets chirping. <laughs> you know, <laughs> For every call for help that there is online, there is an unbelievable list of jerks not helping, but, but feeling the need to comment, right? Now, now, somebody that is that telling me that's that, that the default it? password is face punch. Of course it is. Now, somebody told me that on Twitter, and I thought he was joking, like I was like, ha, ha. But apparently that is, in fact, you'd go face punch, that is face punch, face, face punch. punch. So I'm going to go back home and try it again. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but I was going to do it here with a DHCP Ethernet connection. Yeah, I figured, sure, well, sure. then I can get online. But uh, the, the, the login screen's beautiful. <laughs> it's a beautiful blue I've color. It's, it's nice. blue. It is blue, yeah. It's blue. That's as so far as I've that. been. You got that going for you, you know? Yeah. But anyway, it's, it, it, you know, it's actually pretty easy uh, to install the thing. And, and, and I just told my MSI Win boot from the USB key. What I'm curious is how much of it will work. Um, yes. I mean, most of these netbooks are pretty similar. And I had upgraded right. that one with an Intel, um, a different Wi-Fi card, a more compatible Wi-Fi card. So we shall see. Yeah. I'm curious to see it. Yeah. You know, I forgot to bring it in. I was going to bring it in. But uh, anyway, I, I, what do you think? I think this is a big deal. And this falls under an interesting category because, uh, you know, as with cloud computing, you know, it seems like people have fallen one you know, side or the other of this argument. Um, I, I don't really, I don't have any feeling for whether or not this is going to be the next big thing per se. But I think this is changing everything regardless. So uh, if they are massively unsuccessful... At the very least, I think Google will have gotten Microsoft to do some different things, right? <laughs> you know, including things around pricing, which be which would be really interesting. If this thing is very successful or even moderately successful, I think we might see something a year or two from now where Microsoft reduces or even removes the cost of Windows Seven starter for PC makers, right, as a way to prevent them from going to Google. You know, because the alternative right now in a netbook is is Linux. And when you look at the, you know, what consumers want between even Windows XP and Linux, there's no comparison, right? Right. They've overwhelmingly chosen Windows XP. Yeah. Yep. There's even, so, uh, you know, netbook uh, remixes of Ubuntu that are pretty straightforward, but nope. Absolutely. Right, right. Nope. You know, the, the advantage to being able to run Linux applications is not much of an advantage, no. you know, as it turns out. No. So the real advantage in many ways then would be just excellent access to your online services, right? And that's what they're offering. I, you know, Google's positioning this as a second machine, sort of a companion machine. I think that's smart. I mean, that's what netbooks are. Um, but I also think this is really just a first step in the door. And I think that Microsoft would be crazy not to view this in that light. You know, that this is not the end game, right? In other words, if they successfully deliver this thing they promised a year from now, they're not done. You know, that... The future of this thing probably is some kind of melding of the code bases of this product and, and their phone software, Android, that there is a move afoot at Google to push Microsoft off of the desktop. You know, one thing that I have been rereading in the wake of that Ken Aletta book about Google, which is excellent, again, by the way, and I recommended that a few weeks ago, is I went back and I, I've started rereading his, one of his previous books, World War 3.0 which is the story of Microsoft's antitrust trial. And what's amazing about it is, here we are 10 years later, and the same battle is occurring, except that Netscape has been replaced by Google. And the big difference between Netscape and Google is that Google has an infinite amount of money and that they can just throw cash at anything they want. Yeah, they, they kind There's, of have a, an engine that powers it that doesn't require success Right. In Chromium, for instance. Right. Or so when someone yeah. like, you know, Mark Andreessen as a 20-something whatever, you know, makes this bold claim that they're going to reduce Windows to a, a bad, you know, a badly written set of device drivers. You know, he just comes off as a jerk. Right. Because he, you don't have he the doesn't resources. have the power to make it happen. Yeah. You don't have the resources. Google can do whatever they want. Right. And that's fascinating because it's the first time that Microsoft has ever faced anyone that has the, the reach and the financial means that they do. Right. So, you know, Apple, uh, big company, right? Um, 
very successful in, in certain markets and so forth. But, you know, you always had this kind of David Goliath feel to that fight, didn't you? I mean, as, as, oh, yeah. as good as the Apple stuff is and as, as, as big a company as they are, you know, they never really seem to stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with Microsoft. Although, I guess from a market cap standpoint, that could be changing. Um, but Microsoft, you know, has always had tens of billions of dollars to throw at whatever they want. Well, it's not just money. It's mind share. And no, Apple everything. didn't have it's the mind share. But Google well, does have that mind share. I mean, that's part that of the currency. Well, but Netscape did too, right? Ten years ago, Netscape, it was all yeah, Netscape. Yeah. Netscape was, how you, was the internet, you know? It really was. It was the only way to get online. Yeah. Right? Yeah, I remember in 95 when IE3 came out, I did an editorial on the site, which was on MSNBC, yep. in which I said, stand back, Netscape. In fact, I think I said, sell your stock because, <laughs> because Microsoft's here and yep. it's over. And I remember uh, somebody told me Mark Andreessen was watching and, and like turned purple and went screaming down the hall, who is this Leo Laporte, this son of a bitch? But a year later... Sure. They were sold to AOL. I mean, it, it really it really was kind of the end. Yeah, but pretty quick, yeah. And so when Microsoft gets in gear, but you, but you don't think that's going to happen with Chromium or well, Chrome OS? I don't think that... Well, the, the, the differences here are that Google, unlike Microsoft... I'm sorry, unlike Netscape, is not starting from a dominant no, position. No, Netscape right? was so charging the market the browser, is, The market the is not theirs to lose, as it right. was with Netscape. And right. Netscape did nothing but lose market share. But they were okay. but, you know, you had to pay for Netscape at that time. You were still buying it. Well, b businesses did, right? Individuals could use it. I think print. this was the time when you still had to pay for it. Later, as a, as a last-ditch attempt to save the company, I they would, made it free. I'd love to find someone who actually paid money for Netscape. <laughs> but I, I, don't think any, I don't think anyone realistically ever you know, did that. But um, No, Google... The, the issue for Google is they're starting from the bottom. But there's something really interesting, and I've always been fascinated by this. I, I, I'm almost, you know, there's almost like a monk-like nature to these new platforms. When you look at something like the iPhone when it first came out, when all you could do was create web applications, remember that? Or, or just the web itself. We talk about web 2.0 applications. Or now we look at this Google uh, Chrome OS, where it, Windows is established. It's been around for 25 years almost. It's a rich environment that, you know, does 3D graphics and all this other stuff. And some of the UIs that are capable or possible on a system like that are astonishing. But when you look at a very basic platform, it's almost like a, it's a stripped down kind of thing. And you ha it's, it's kind of a back to basics experience. I, I have a weird affinity for that kind of thing. I, um, you know, the, using a netbook or a Mac mini type machine or something, it, I've always had this weird love of these very super simple devices well there's a time and, when it's the right time i mean you wouldn't use it all yeah. the time no not necessarily but like i said i i think that the chrome os thing is only the beginning you know that it's going to become more sophisticated over time i i think that in the beginning it's going to score pretty big because of the pricing and because people really do want to get online with these things it's it, it wait, fulfills wait, 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 it's free point. yeah right that's what i meant <laughs> it's free well windows 7 start is not free so in other words if you go into a store a year from now and you have the same netbook and they're right next to each other. Oh, I see. And one of them is three seventy nine and one of them is two ninety nine. Right. Or whatever. You're gonna you're gonna buy the cheap one. I think some people will. So the end game here is Microsoft is gonna have to lower prices. I, I just think that's what this is gonna trigger. That's okay with me. Yeah, that's so a good, that's in other a good words, thing. In they the already end, have lowered prices. Right. Really. I mean you know, but the difference here, I think the thing that's interesting is from, from a PC perspective, Microsoft is the dominant company. You know, someone coming in and undercutting Microsoft, no one is going to have an issue with this, right? There are no legal issues there. Uh, it, it benefits everybody, right? Microsoft, if Microsoft cuts prices to match this new competitor, as they should, then everyone benefits. Did you read uh, Bill Gurley's uh, less than free post in his uh, blog above the crowd? No, I didn't. Recommended. Okay. He says the reason Google is really disruptive is yeah. not because it's cheaper, but but because it's less than free. And it's the, less than it's free. It's less than free. The example he gives is uh, actually to, to speaks to the Ford Sync thing we were just talking about. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, Ford pays Microsoft for Windows CE. In the new model, Android they could put Android in there, which is not only free, but Google pays them. A, yes. sh a share of advertising and searches. So it's uh, subsidized. It's almost. subsidized. It's they pay you for it. And yeah. that's very hard to compete with if you're Microsoft. 
it's you know it's hard to see the future. I, I I do recall thinking years ago that there was nothing about Google that would make it a long term success compared to something like Alta Vista or any of the other search engines that came before it, right? Because I guess the word I'm thinking of is sticky. You know, there's nothing keeping you there. Right. But the thing that's interesting about Google, of course, is despite the fact that they have nothing that makes them any money except for advertising, they also have a thousand and one different products and services that they offer to consumers typically, but also to businesses, most of which are absolutely free. And the more that you involve yourself in these things, if you use Gmail, if you use Google Calendar, Google Reader, or uh, Google Voice, which is amazing, the more you invest in this kind of ecosystem that they're creating, right? The fact that these things don't, in fact, directly make Google any money doesn't matter because now, now you are stuck, <laughs> right? right. You, the, the stickiness to the Google platform, such as it is, it's funny. It's, it has nothing to do with the one thing that makes the money. I don't think anyone goes to Google because of the ads. No, of course not. Right? Yeah. And I, I don't think anyone has made, I think few people have made an honest attempt to compare the search results from Google with other search engines. I don't, I think people just stop looking, you know? Well, it's, if, I, if there's a difference, it's not so significant that you'd know it. And that's right. the point. I mean, if I had to really kind of check and research, okay. Remember Danny yeah. Sullivan's search engine watch? That was what he did in the beginning. Sure. Now he's gone way beyond that. But in the beginning, that's what search engine watch was all about was, well, which is the best search engine? But now you just go, Google's fine. Google's yeah, good enough. Fine. And that's actually the problem because the lack of stickiness almost doesn't matter because what you need to compete with Google is something that will get people off. And you can see how Microsoft's handling that. They're looking at vertical searches and cashback programs and right. you know other right. ways of getting people off of Google. But the truth is, you know, it's easy to get comfortable. And it's, like I said, once you... a hard thing to break. Right. And once you're invested in that ecosystem with the other stuff... Yeah. Getting people off of there. You know, if you're a Google guy, so to speak, I mean, you use Gmail and Google Calendar. I am. So I am. I'm all Google. Why would you, why would you use Bing? I don't need to I, use Bing unless... I mean... It would have to be... And uh, this, this is what... Um, I've quoted this guy many times before. Uh, management consultant Peter... Uh, oh, I can't remember his last name. But anyway, he always said... If a product's going to beat an, an incumbent, it has to, it can't just be a little better. It has to be 10 times better. Yes. And, Peter, and Drucker. This is the, right. Peter Drucker. This is the conversation we had about Linux years ago that, you know. It's just not 10 Linux times is, better. It's sort of interesting from a technological perspective. Um, it certainly has some of that, you know, <laughs> monk-like austerity stuff that I was talking about. But, you know, uh, to become an, uh, a phenomenon with consumers, yeah, it has to be better. It can't be Windows 1.1, you know. It has to be a or lot it can't better. be almost as good as one. It has to be like twice as good, yeah. five times as good. A lot and and how do you do that? You can't. Even the Mac isn't five times as good as Windows. I mean, they're, these things are roughly comparable. So, uh, you know, how how does Linux come out of nowhere and 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 do something better? So I think, but I think the reason that Android or Google Chrome OS are interesting is because these things don't exist in isolation. You know, Chrome OS becomes part of the Google ecosystem. And if you care about the Google stuff, if you use it, you want to run on Google. Right? Right. You want to run the Google right. stuff. I think they have a chance. What about, I mean, I think my, Microsoft's, nobody's going to, well, let me ask you this. <laughs> let me, let me okay. finish the sentence. Uh, yes. Just a thought. Um, no. <laughs> I'm just, I have so 42. many, my head yes. overflowing. So. I understand. Wouldn't people still want two computers, one with Chrome, Chrome OS on it for like your long-lasting battery, quick instant on email thing, and then a Windows PC yep. for everything else? For so Microsoft is like, at least at parity, right? For the complexity? <laughs> yeah. I, for the, yeah. the challenge? No, if you're going to you know, play games, well, maybe not. <laughs> yeah. um, well, you know, I, no, I, I think over time, this is a sort of a short-sighted view, and, and a lot of people will come back with that argument because... Uh, they have again. They have a hard time moving on. You know, well, you'll never be able to do this thing on the web. Or what happens when you know? You know, there's always these easily refuted arguments. Um, if you can step beyond the way things have always been done, uh, maybe you'll find a better way to do things. You know, what, one of the the complaints I have about programs like Microsoft Outlook is that I don't honestly think anyone at Microsoft. It never occurred to anyone at Microsoft to rethink how email works. They just keep building on top of this thing that they have. One of the things that makes Google's Gmail service so interesting is that they were starting from scratch. And in the beginning, everyone kind of laughed, oh, webmail, uh, you know. And then you actually use it and you think, oh, my God, 
this is genius. Yeah. You know, yeah. They've done something amazing here. Sometimes you really do have to start over. Do you and think, in a, in a way, then, this is kind of interesting, Linux is going to win? Well, yeah, sort of. Via I mean, Google. And OS X is going to win, you know, on the phone, via <laughs> the iPhone. I mean, so for some people, that will be kind of a Pyrrhic victory, I guess, in both cases. But, yeah, I suppose so. I, I think that, you know, the, the PC itself is maturing as a technology. And I, I think the line has blurred between Mac OS X and Windows, especially with Windows 7. Um, and with Snow Leopard, too, actually. I mean, I, it's funny how those two things kind of parallel each other. Right. Um, both companies have been around for a long time making PC operating systems, and they're both running into the same kind of issues. You know, there's only so far you can go. Right. Apple's most innovative work is on the iPhone. And not coincidentally, that's a place where they had to really start over from scratch. You know, I realize they're reusing APIs and all that stuff. I, I get that it's sort of a, a stripped-down version of the existing system. Um, but that's what makes it interesting, you know, and when you have to, f when you, when you have to work within the confines of something that's different, all of a sudden these new innovative things occur, you know, I mean, we can, we're going to come up with new windows versions for a while here, I'm sure. And I'm, I'm sure some of the stuff they do will be really interesting, but ultimately what we're talking about is the next version of the same thing. Right. You know, so the first version of Chrome OS, no, it's not, I don't think it's going to blow away windows. Let's not get crazy. But I think the ramifications of that thing are going to be felt all over the place. And I think it's going to affect Windows. And I think that's going to be a positive impact for everyone who uses Windows or everyone who uses computers, whatever you happen to use. Right. You know? Very, very interesting, Mr. Therat. You are a great <laughs> and deep thinker, my friend. Well, no, and, I just... And if no. you ever see the little man with a black bird, please contact me. No, I don't know. <laughs> channeling Sydney Green Street. I don't know why. <laughs> Did your Kindle update? I updated it manually. Oh, because mine, I kept, I turned it on. I went wireless. I couldn't. So how do you update it manually? Yeah. You, have, you can download a file from Amazon uh, and copy it over. And then it, it's a weird kind of process. You know, you hit the menu key and you get the menu. And then you go to settings. And then you hit menu again. And one of the options will say update the Kindle, but only if you copy this file in. So you have to cook, so. cook it up to your computer? Yeah, hook it up to your computer, download the file. Uh, it's literally called what? update Kindle. Won't it do know. it uh, automatically? Yeah, eventually? it will. So supposedly over time, it will. But, you know, one of the big, I don't want to wait, right? Because one of my big complaints about the Kindle, one of my only complaints, is that, you know, when you leave the wireless on, the battery life isn't that great. Right. And now it's supposed to be dramatically better. Oh, so good. Good. Because yeah, I've been that. turning mine off. Well, you know, since I got the Kindle 2 about a year ago, right? That's when it came out last year. I want to say November last year. Yeah. Um, I had the original Kindle. My wife has that one. I got the Kindle 2. I love the thing. Mm -hmm. But over the past year, they've done some things with it uh, that I kind of wish I could get my hands on. So, for example, they've released an international version. So if you bring right. this thing overseas, it will update. That's a hardware update because you got to get the, the radios. It's hard. That kind of bothered me because yeah. I go to Europe a lot, and it would be kind of cool to have yeah. this thing. And I'm not going to spend another two hundred and seventy dollars or whatever. Two fifty nine. They function. dropped it. Okay, so I saw the announcement about this the other day, the the, the Kindle update. Yeah. And I thought, you know, here they go again, right? I'm glad they're updating it. This is awesome functionality. There are two things they've added, right? The better battery life, eighty five percent better, almost twice as good. And the PDF support that was previously only available on the Kindle DX, which is the large form factor device. But I thought, you know, here we are again. I'm, what am I going to do? I'm going to spend $260 and get the exact same device, but with this extra, you know, stuff in it. That kind of stinks. And fortunately, I didn't have to do that because these two bits of functionality are available to anyone who has a, a Kindle 2. Yeah. 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 So, uh, Okay. I'll go download it, I guess. I don't really need it right away. The PDF, yeah, I don't know I mean, what's going to happen, happen with PDF. I don't know how do you... Yeah, actually, it's funny. So, actually... The screen's not so point. big. I copied over some PDF files, what and I never even like? looked at them. So, let's see what it does. Yeah, because I think, you know, with a small screen... I mean, I understand the DX, because then, in theory, you could render it as an 8.5 by 11 page. Mm -hmm. But what are you going to do with... Will I... Will you scroll around in it? Will it... Oh, well, well it? one of the other options that's new, apparently, is the availability... The uh, possibility, or the capability of rotating the screen and manually changing the orientation no now that's I've, cool that's to that either that's interesting that would be so that's actually, probably for the pdfs yeah it is so let me try that right now because i i 
I actually downloaded some pretty complex PDFs. I don't see a way to do this. I'm not sure how to. I don't know. There's a, some. I have to go look this one up. I'm not sure how to do it. But this one in particular happens to be a. The PDF. The the page size is square. So when you when you're looking at it in portrait form, it's kind of you know it doesn't look very good. But I, if you could put do this sideways, you'd probably be able to read the text better. Yeah, exactly. But, it might be a little wider, wide enough. Yeah. I don't know how to do it. Yeah. Oh, that's okay. Anyway, cool. Let me know how the battery life thing is. I know. Well, that's the thing. So it probably just turns off the radio and turns it on periodically. That's all I'd have to do. <laughs> that could, yeah. We suggested that. Sure. That's Schedule all I have it. to do. Schedule, Schedule it. it. Right. In other words, if I, I need to be uh, online all the time. Yeah, when I go to, if I happen to be on the web and I buy a, a book and send it to my Kindle, I guess I would know I need to go right. Turn do on. that thing. But That's yeah, you I know, do. it downloads the newspapers at three o'clock in the morning. Why can't it just turn on at three o'clock in the morning and check? Exactly. You know? Exactly. I have all the answers, Leo. You're brilliant. He's the brilliant, <laughs> brilliant Paul Therott. And some good news coming up in just a little bit for all Paul Therott fans. <laughs> Yes, but before we do that, I do want to mention, go to my PC from the folks at Citrix, the greatest remote access solution ever made. And I, you don't have to take my word for it. It's Citrix is uh, the remote access solution Microsoft uses. They licensed it for RDP. Maybe you've thought, though, when you hear something like that, I probably scare people. They go, oh, well, if that's the case, it's far too complicated for me. Well, no, my friends. Go to my PC is the easy-use remote access solution. Underlying, of course, the very powerful technology, but on top, couldn't be easier. In fact, I think you could do it right now. If you're in front of a browser, go to mypc.com slash windows. Go there right now. You give them a little bit of information. You press download. Within two minutes, it's done. No router configuration. It uses NAT traversal. No firewall issues. It just works. Now, wherever you go, all you have to do is go to the website, go to mypc.com. See, this is why it works. This is so smart. They use this kind of third-party negotiation. You go to go to mypc.com. You, you enter in your username and password, and boom, there's your desktop. Just like you're there. You can send and receive email, access any network resource, uh, run any program, even drag and drop files from one to the other. 128-bit SSL encryption. You're 100% secure. I mean, that, this couldn't be easier. You're going away for Thanksgiving over the river through the woods to grandmother's house we go. Holidays are coming up. Maybe you don't want to stay at work a little extra just to get that email answered or you do those last, uh, you know, what do they call them, TPA reports. You don't have to come in on, mm, uh, yeah, would you come in on the weekend? No. Go to go to mypc.com slash windows. And uh, and he'll never know you're not there. You everything gets done. We thank him so much for their support, and I encourage you to try it free for 30 days. No, absolutely no limits. Use as much as you want. Use it all the time. Go to mypc.com slash windows. We thank him so much for their support of Windows Weekly. Paul Farat. <laughs> So it was almost an Oprah sound. Uh, Oprah or opera. It is uh, time to say something good about this show. Okay. I've been thinking all week. It had to happen eventually. <laughs> the good news is we are you're you're one of the five on the Roku box, and it rolled out this week. So if you have a Roku, and we sent you sure. one, right? So you have a Roku. I know you have one. Um, all you have to do is go to... Um, I think update, update your Roku, and you will have a new Roku application feature that allows you to download some free applications under your Roku player, including one you might just recognize called Twit. Also, Can revision. Have a picture of it? Can I see what it looks like? Yeah. Your revision 3 is there. Mm -hmm. um, the new, it's called, like, they call it the channel store. Pandora is there. Right. Now, previously, this box had, uh, or has, it still has, obviously, Netflix and. Amazon. Amazon On Demand. You could buy Major League Baseball. Now, with the Channel Store, mm -hmm. it's got Twit. It's got Pandora, Flickr, your Flickr photos, or your Facebook photos, Revision 3's shows, yep. Motion Box, Mediafly, which lets you... Thing. Which, the important thing. The important thing is Twit. Right. Netcasts you love from people you trust. You know, that one. That one, yeah. That one right there. You can get... and. We are now making available on the Roku box. And by the way, this is also available. We'll be available on our website at twit.tv. We're updating the website so you can start watching the video. Mm -hmm. uh, and on iTunes, you can subscribe to it. The five wow. shows that launch 
uh, right up the front are yours. Mm -hmm. Mac Break Weekly, because, you know, we can't do Windows Weekly without doing Mac Break Weekly. Twit, Twiff, and Twig. Twit, Twiff, <laughs> and, and Twig. twig. Wow. Dane has already told I'm me you, you may not do that name. Twim, Twig, Twiff, and yeah. what was the last yeah. one? Twa? Twit, Twit, Twit. That's a, quite a network you've made. <laughs> <laughs> this week in tech, this week in fun, and this week in Google, Windows okay. Weekly and Mac Break Weekly. Those are the five. But we will launch, uh, we're hoping to launch another show every week until we get all 15 shows on. Uh, yes. And we're even launching some new shows. We did our first uh, ver episode of Not Safe for Work, NSFW, last night. <laughs> Nice. It's good. Rated R. Rated R. Uh, apparently, now I was on, and it, there was nothing uh, untoward happened while I was there. But apparently, that's because I was there, and they plan to be really rasty and rowdy. You know who it is? Brian Brushwood, who does Scam okay. School and Revision Three, is a magician, yeah. very talented. He's doing it from his home in Austin, uh, and it's just—it was a great time. Anyway, so we have new shows, and we will—all of those will eventually get on Roku. In mm -hmm. fact. Uh, soon, I don't know, I, soon with a lowercase s, because I'm not sure exactly how soon, but I don't know. It could be next week, could be next month. Okay. You will be able to go to that on your Roku Watch and watch the live stream yeah. of anything as well as download, you know, whatever else yeah, is on yeah, it. Yeah. That's how Major yeah, League that's... Baseball works. You could watch a, a game in progress. Listen, the parallels between what we do and Major League Baseball are enormous not to mention that no version of this show may be reproduced in any form <laughs> but express written commission commission yeah, yeah, of the yeah. baseball commission. i have a, a a weird lump in my stomach thinking about the all the people watching i should have that looked at but uh, thinking of <laughs> anyone home alone on a friday night and thinking you know amazon on demand or <laughs> No, no, Leo it's not friday it's not friday night viewing i don't believe i believe yeah, i really believe yeah. that the future of twit is more like monday morning you know, <laughs> Tuesday, <laughs> Tuesday hangover. afternoon, hangover, yeah. Yeah, you yeah. know, Thursday, midday, that kind of thing. But I don't okay. know. I mean, it, uh, I don't know. And in fact, we are adding more pro primetime programming because we do hope that people will watch us uh, at any time of the day or night. So sure. that's, that's uh, I'm, I'm really excited. Actually, when you sometimes you just disconnect me and I, I talk for two more hours. See, you know. See, that's what Art Bell. Remember, Art Bell used to do coast to coast crazy, you know, sci, you know, yeah, sci-fi yeah. weird, you know, flying saucer stuff. Yeah. He would get over. He would get his show would be done. He lived in a double wide in Pahrump, and his show would be done. That's and great. he would go across the double wide. He would turn on the yeah. ham radio gear, and he would keep doing the show on ham. Probably talk to himself on the way over there too. You know. Yeah, he couldn't stop. That's yeah, good stuff. Yeah, that's good. So basically, well, he's, I'm, I'm he no had different. The love. <laughs> he, had the love. he had the love. Oh, Art Bell. Everybody loves Art Bell. So sure. the only difference is we don't talk about UFOs. We talk no. about YouTube. Sure. That's the only difference. Speaking of Let's YouTube. Okay. <laughs> YouTube captioning and an epiphany from Mr. Paul Thorat, ladies and gentlemen. Yes, an epiphany. epiphany. I have these so infrequently. I thought Did the I would angels share it. sing when you had the epiphany? <laughs> sort of. Oh. Um, <laughs> I should have written this up, and maybe I still will. Um, I have a son who's who's deaf, and... He has cochlear implants, and he can hear. And oh, that's neat! Speaks. I didn't know he had a cochlear implant. Oh, that's really yeah. cool. Yeah, he speaks normally, and and he doesn't hear normally, but he hears, you know, something. Was and he born deaf, or did he come to no, he, later in life? He became sick uh, when he was about oh, a year old. Sad, but you know, that's where cochlears are supposed to work best, right? Because if you if you if yeah. you never heard, and, and obviously it's getting better all the time. You know, I that's think so cool. if this had happened to him today, they would have done a bilateral implant immediately. We did the second one years later, and. And all that stuff. But, you know, he's, whatever. This isn't meant to be a sob story. He's doing great. No, but, no, no. But it's, but it's a wonderful story with technology in it because those cochlear implants that are in his ear then go to a little computer, which interprets what is it's yeah, saying, and yeah. he can hear. You, uh, you have to think as a source of stress because I know enough about computers to realize, <laughs> you know, anything could happen there. But anything can happen. So you hope for the best. Do you use sign language? Does he speak sign language? No, no sign language. So we've, uh, he's mainstream and wow. um, that's been the point. So hopefully Very everything goes, everything's been going great. He goes to a, a, a public high school, uh, sorry, middle school. That's fantastic. And um, yeah, everything's good. So, but when this, he watches this TV is shows, this is relevant. This is relevant to this. Yeah. We're not just talking about my kid. Uh, he needs captioning. So on obviously on cable TV, everything's captioned. It's the law. Uh, it's, you know, one thing we happen to know, unfortunately, because of Mark, is that uh, ca captioning can be of different quality. I mean, some of it's great, some of it's terrible. It depends on what it is. But when you look at the world post-DVD, right, obviously DVDs have 
captioning and they have subtitles of different languages and all that stuff. Electronically, uh, electro uh, like digital video and so forth, you know, captioning is kind of a mixed bag. And YouTube this week announced that they were going to automatically or add automatic captioning to all YouTube videos. And, and fact, also the offer... En the engineer who did this is deaf. Yeah. So it's, it is really neat. I think it's wonderful. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's neat. Yeah. So it's good and bad. I mean, uh, it's bad in the sense that they're using the same technology they use on Google Voice. And anyone who's used oh. the automatic transcription oh, dear. Uh, oh, dear. capabilities of Google Voice will tell you that uh, it's not always great. No. You know, there's, a, a there's, guy, a little, uh, there's some comedy in here. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. as recently as yesterday, I had a message from a guy from uh, the Boston Network User Group, which is BNUG. And of course, that was transcribed as Peanut. <laughs> you know, so I'm looking at this message and I'm, uh, you know, what, what, <laughs> you know, I have no idea what it said, but anyway, I get those nothing. all the time. And you know, you, you get pretty good at, it's kind of a fun game to figure out what it meant. Um, something that is almost as profound though, is that Google is making it very, very easy for people to add captioning to their own videos. And what they're asking people to do is just upload a text file that has the, the words that are spoken in the video and then they will map those words to the proper moments in the video for you. And that's actually pretty cool. So the fact that they're doing this universally, I think, is excellent. Uh, I think the technology will get better over time. I think it's going to be kind of lousy in the beginning based on the Google Voice experience. But you know what? At least they're doing it. But what this reminded me of was if you look at digital videos, and you can get digital videos from places like iTunes or Amazon On Demand, uh, Roku has this box that you can get Netflix, on, uh, you know, streamable movies on there. Zune obviously offers uh, movies and so forth. There's, there's various things online for this. Almost none of them have captioning. Almost none of them. Uh, Ro uh, sorry, not Roku. Uh, Netflix says that they're going to be adding this functionality. Most of the other places are pretty silent about it. But the one company that does do this, not universally, not even close, but at least they do do it, is Apple. And Apple also has technology built into QuickTime that hasn't been exposed to end users via any form of uh, player or editor, but where you can turn captions and subtitles on and off, right, uh, without having to create two versions of the video. So, for example, if I were to rip a DVD today for my son, I would rip a version where the captions were hard encoded into the video. They're just part of the video. You can't turn them off. They're just on. But if it's a video that, you know, maybe I wanted a copy of as well, like Star Wars or something... I'd have to make him a copy and I'd have to make me a copy. There would be two different versions. Using newer technology like what Apple has, it, it is technical, technically possible, although not by me as an end user, to encode a single video where you can turn vid, you know, captioning on and off. That's excellent, right? Because that, that works like captioning works on TV or like captioning works on a DVD. That's what you want. Right. Um, if you go to the iTunes store today, Apple sells... Uh, some number of videos. Um, I'm sure it's hundreds of thousands. I have no idea how many. There's a teeny subset, but there is a subset that offers this captioning capability. So it's possible to go to the store, search for movies, and only get search results that show the, the movies that are captioned. So Apple is the one mainstream choice that has captions, which is important for me because, again, my kid has this need, and uh, it's hard to find digital video that has captioning, but Apple does do it. And you may recall a few weeks back, I, we were, I was talking about sort of reflecting on the Zune HD and some of the issues that arise from not being part of the Apple ecosystem and so forth. And I think it's important for me, and this is, again, this doesn't apply to everybody, but because of my son, you know, you have to look at the Apple ecosystem and think at least they're doing it, right? Yep. You know, Disney yep. doesn't make any of their movies available with captioning through iTunes. They should, they don't, yeah, but crazy. at least Apple makes it possible right so there are movies up there many movies um that have captioning so i guess this this falls into this thing you know for me and this is a personal issue but uh and again doesn't apply to everybody but when i you know when you pick technology uh, you try to make you try to pick the technology that makes the most sense for you and answers whatever needs you may have and this is actually a need that i do have and I, i'm glad that youtube is doing this and i'm glad that apple is doing it partially and I hope that other companies will do it as well. But, you know, this is an area where Microsoft has just done the, you know, the basics and, and is not really fully serving the needs of everyone who needs to watch this content. So, uh, you know, the notion of buying a movie 
on Zoom versus buying it on iTunes, it becomes more obvious that in my case, I need to, buy, you know, if I'm going to be doing that sort of thing and not buying a DVD, um, then, you know, I should be shopping at iTunes, right? Because, you know, that's the one service that does meet this need. Anyway, I'm curious to see what happens with YouTube and how they, uh, the, how they make it work. And I'm sure in the near future, we will have humorous screenshots of <laughs> crazy, really transcoded crazy transcription. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And I think that uh, providers can provide uh, text that is time coded so that you can have good yeah, you don't right. have to have the automated ones. You can have good ones. Right. You know, somebody Google. somebody just told me that the new handbrake, which just came out this week, uh, oh. will rip uh, subtitles. Now that's exactly what I've been looking for. Well, hand handbrake. I'll have to look at that. You're saying a new version has come out this week? Yeah, point nine four just came out Monday, and somebody in the that. chat room just said it does subtitles. So when you rip your DVD, you will now have subtitles. But are they so? Are there subtitles you can turn on and off? Oh. Probably not. I mean, Probably. you've always no. You've always been able to add them to the video. Oh, okay. That's always been there. Well, then I wonder. I don't know. I don't know what he's talking about. But I, I just thought I'd throw point you. I'll look at. It. It. I yeah. didn't know. Yeah. Didn't know. It does have so. some other improvements. Oh well, yeah. No. Obviously, every time that comes out, you have to get the new version. I think accessibility is so important. I'm very aware of that. I know. Okay, it. So let me actually, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll just read what it says. They have soft subtitles. Oh. Handbrake can now include subtitle tracks that can be turned on and off <gasps> instead of rendering them onto the video track permanently. Yay! Which also is video compression. Yes, that's fantastic. I love them. So that's that's good stuff. And by the way, for whatever it's worth, you know, my son my son spends a lot of time on YouTube, especially watching, you know, Call of Duty videos. And, you know, people record these crazy exploits they have in the game. And you can, you know, you can watch the incredible kill cam shot or whatever it is. Yeah. And I said to him, I said, hey, by the way, you know, YouTube is going to make it possible for the videos to have automatic captioning, so you'll be able to turn that thing on and off. And he was actually legitimately excited about that. Oh, that's neat. And uh, I thought that was kind of cool. Then I had to disappoint him and say, they're probably going to stink. <laughs> you know, but, but at least it's there. You know? It's something. So good, good for a handbrake. Uh, that's neat. It's something. Wow, that's, that's really, uh, that's kind of that's exciting. That's really going to play with this. Yeah. Like so. Let's take a break. I know you have some uh, picks. You kind of tipped your hand on that. <laughs> well, now we have a new pick. Uh, we just had another one. We've tipped our yeah. we've doubly tipped, but I'm sure we'll find something to get people to listen to this commercial. Just keep working on. It. <laughs> it's time to mention Audible.com. Our free book is available at Audible.com/slash Windows. Audible is a great library of audio books. It's the premier provider of audio books now. There's nobody even, uh, not even a close second. And I'm thrilled because the readers they use are so good. The quality of the audio is so high, especially this new enhanced format, that it's just, they're just a joy to listen to. I woke up uh, early for some reason. The kids had the day off. There was no reason I had to get up early. I guess my body's just used to getting up early. So I listened to for an hour and a half to a uh, Don, uh, to uh, Lucifer's Hammer, uh, Jerry Pornell and Larry Niven's incredible uh, sci-fi yeah, book. Yeah, I loved yeah. it. And it's a new reading, too, because they never did make an audio book of it, but Audible has this uh, Audible Frontiers program where they take classic science fiction and they do, for the first time ever, audio versions of it. I just have to, I just have to praise them, give them props for, uh, for bringing you know, such I, great stuff to us. I kind, of, I kind of know Jerry Pornell now. You know, I, I run into him at these shows all the time. But his... Early stuff with Larry Niven, especially it's so good, is among yeah the best books I've ever read. It's kind of dated. Like every time they're watching TV, they say color TV. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. It's like well, the, right. So the problem when you're working in the future in a book is you're yeah that one. Run. But see, that one's supposed to take place in the 70s. So because um, you know it's a comet hits the Earth, and what happens after the comet hits the Earth? And uh, but it's just little things like that. It's so funny. Oh, yeah. No, the, the moat in God's eye is fantastic. Hey, you know, yeah. Jerry's going to be on uh, Twit on Sunday. Oh, yeah? Um, to talk about PDC and stuff. Why don't you come on, too? If you'd like to. Sunday. Sunday. We do it at uh, 6 p.m. your time, 6 p.m. Eastern. Let me check. Yeah, if, if I, you can. If I can, if you can we'd love to have you. Look at, you know, people people I, constantly... I, saying, I have to look at my schedule, because this is not in my schedule. I have to check with my wife. I yeah, think that's the saying. schedule. My wife does our can, schedule, too. Yeah, but people are always saying to me, please get Paul on Twit. Paul would be great on Twit. <laughs> Paul's so, a Twit. Paul's a Twit. It seems like he should be there. Do you have a, uh, I, don't, I don't see, do you have an Audible recommendation? I do, I do. Actually, anything by Jerry Purnell would be excellent, but uh, 
And I actually, it'd be interesting to see what they have for Jerry Pinnell in there. You know, the more, they, this, this, this uh, Lucifer's Hammer just came out, and so uh, I was really thrilled when it came out. Okay. Um, Why don't we just use that one, actually? I do have one, but I'll, I'll wait till next week. Sure. I, you know, I wanted to recommend the new Michael Crichton book, but I read a review of it that was so horrible. Oh, no. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get it. Well, I, there's no... So here's the thing. Obviously, Michael Crichton passed away last year. He's one of my favorite authors. And after his death, someone, his wife or whoever, was going through his stuff, and they found a, a completed manuscript for a book. And so one of the big news stories late last year was... New Michael Crichton novel. Right. It's like in a drawer year. somewhere. Yeah. The problem is, yeah, this is almost certainly something he wrote 20, 30, 40 oh, years ago or something. Didn't, didn't, didn't what? And it's, it's, it's sort of immature and, oh, you know, it's like a pirate book. Yeah, I didn't. It didn't heard of this? Yeah, I did. I didn't catch my so eye. So I, I read a review and it just, it sounds, it sounds awful. I, 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 uh, obviously I'm going to read it. I have well, to. Well, we're Crichton it. fans. And I have to yeah. say, his work is uneven. Yeah. <laughs> so this one sounds like... Um, Could be the downside on the uneven. Yes, I mean, he's written uh, some, some of the, the greatest books. Best, uh, Andromeda yeah. Strain was brilliant. Uh, brilliant, absolutely. Yeah. Timeline was okay. I, I, I have a soft spot for Timeline. I Even the too. movie, which is kind of lousy. Yeah. I will If it's on cable, I'll watch it every time. I love that stuff. Well, I love it that they yeah. went back to medieval back France. Back in history. I love, love I it. I just love that thing. Yeah, you know? love it. But even his kind of so-so books like, um, you know, Airframe or whatever, or, or DC, I just, you know, I know, I know what you're saying. But Disclosure, come on, Jurassic Park, I mean, come on, he's the man. You're right, classics. But I don't know about Andrew. Pirates. <laughs> anyway, it's, well, let's... Yeah, after, after three Johnny Depp movies, I don't know. It's yeah. <laughs> Pirates is hard to get into. Lucifer's Hammer came out uh, in July along with The Moten God's Eye, another that Larry Niven... Excellent. Uh, uh, collaboration Jerry did yep. and Escape from Hell, which I had I don't even know about. That came out in February. That one I've read, but that's a Dante's Inferno. That might be a Inferno. It also came out. Okay, I, I think Escape from Hell might be a sequel to Inferno. And then uh, Star Swarm was the first. They've had that one for a while. In fact, did, last time Jerry was on, that was the only one they had. So they yeah, added the, four new ones. Man, in, oh no, was that? See, I get him and uh, Niven mixed up. Somewhere. I love Larry, Larry Niven wrote Wing, Ring World, which would also yeah. be a Niven's classic. The best. Oh. And Niven's, I don't know if there's any Niven short story collections on there, but that stuff is fantastic, though. Well, you know, I guess the best recommendation is go to uh, this, this, the Audible Frontiers section because the incredible stuff. Yeah, I'm going to go look at that after we're done, actually. I didn't realize this Cornell stuff was up there. Yeah, I'm good. really thrilled to see Jerry on here. Uh, yeah, Lucifer's he, Hammer is very dramatic. 24 hours, The Moat in God's Eye. I think that's probably the one everybody considers the masterpiece, right? Yeah. Robert Heinlein said, possibly the finest science fiction novel I have ever read. Sure. Oh, that's next. I'm putting that in my wish list. <laughs> no, it's, oh, it's, it's, that's next. It's good stuff. It's good stuff. Can't I, wait. Honestly, if, you know, looking back at the 70s, you know, sort of Niven and Parnell are right up there with, you know, the best of Asimov, I think. Well, and what's great is Jerry's one of us. I mean, uh, yeah. uh, Chaos Manor, the column he wrote for Byte Magazine, oh, listen, is I, what I, I made me what I am today. In my cellar, I have four or five boxes full of old Byte Magazines, and mm -hmm. it's all his old stuff. I also have the paperback versions of his columns, which came out as books, which have illustrations of him as if he were some kind of a safari warrior guy, you know, going through the, uh, the high-tech wonderland or whatever. Um, he has described himself correctly as the original blogger he was doing this stuff in the 1970s talking oh, yeah. about technology approaching it from the perspective of a writer it was called the user's column more than a yeah. writer i mean he, yeah, he was a great writer oh, but, no, but he a, a, was the user he was the ultimate user and that's really kind of that's what right. informed how you i do what i do can't overstate the impact that this had Huge. on me uh, and i'm sure many other people everybody uh, in the business yeah but but what uh, what always impressed me was he told the story of how it was as a user to install this to run that how yeah. it worked for him as a user and that's what really has informed how I do my tech coverage I represent the user for the user absolutely point of view. yeah yeah no I can point to some very specific things that caused me to communicate differently yes right because technology writing used to be so dry oh yeah and still can be I guess depending on what you're reading. And uh, this was the first, you know, it's like, here's a human being. He lives in a house. 
He's having problems with this stuff, just like everyone else. But here's how he solves it. Yeah. Or here's how we, you know. And his son would always come to the rescue. And <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I just loved it. Yeah. Anyway, Jerry's going to be on Twit uh, on Sunday. But it, you, maybe yeah. your homework assignment is to go to audible.com slash windows and uh, at least start. You won't be able to finish. These are long books. Start The Moat in God's Eye or Lucifer's Hammer or Inferno or uh, Escape from Hell. One of the great science fiction authors of, of, the, of our time. And uh, that's our Audible recommendation. You get it free, audible.com slash windows. Do you have a tip? I, I, I don't think you've done a tip yet, have you? Ever or just today? Just today. <laughs> have you done a tip today? I do. No, I have not. I have two tips today. One, one is a re-tip, if you will. Oh, a lot boy. Of, uh, we are in that season, the re-tipping yeah. <laughs> season. Okay. Um, well, the new one is that if you purchase things through Bing uh, online, and this is what would be one reason to use Bing, you can use this cashback program to actually get money back. And for Black Friday, and I think for a couple of days beyond that, uh, Bing is offering up to 35% cashback oh. from certain retailers. Oh, so that's it's huge. Shopping. But if you use Bing to buy stuff on Dell, for example, you can get 20% back. That's a so, huge rebate. Yeah, it's it's pretty big. So. What you should do uh, to, let's see, how you, how would we find the blog is uh, you need to, I guess, <laughs> Google for, or search on Bing for the Google, Bing blog. Google for Bing. Google for Bing. <laughs> and uh, find out the details. They have a, they have a I'm blog. I'm sure Microsoft won't mind. <laughs> if, <laughs> hey, look, as long as you end up using Bing. As long as you end up using Bing, please. So that's, that's the new one. So I, I, I have a blog post about this today. I thought this would be of use to people. Uh, the other one is just, and this is something that came up before, but I've gotten a lot of email uh, about this and mo most recently from Dominic Ware that uh, there is a site called Alternative 2. Yeah, we've talked about it before, haven't yeah. we? Yeah, it allows you to search for free replacements for, you know, common software types. So uh, this one's really interesting. And, and this actually factors into something. I, I have this in my notes. You know, I've been looking for a, I'm going to use this today. Uh, I'll, I'll use the site to try to find something today. I've been looking for a good solution for something that is, uh, it's a very particular need. So uh, Windows Home Server, or you can use things like Live Mesh, have remote desktop capabilities or VNC or whatever, right? We can log on to a remote desktop and you actually see the desktop in a window on your screen and you can do things with it. And that's, that's neat. But what I'm really looking for is a way just to do a remote file copy. In other words, I want to be able to hit a, a machine remotely, access the contents of the hard drive, and then copy it back and forth, a la FTP or whatever. And I'm look, so I guess what I'm looking for is sort of a VNC type solution sans the, the desktop. I just want a very simple file explorer type view where you copy back and forth. Now, it's possible to do this in things like LogMeIn, but it's not for the version of LogMeIn that does that is not free. And obviously, you can do this through Windows Home Server, but it's a web interface and it's not great. And in my case, unfortunately, because I'm on Fios with this lousy Action Tech router, uh, that's something I have to keep reconfiguring. So I'd like to I'd like to figure out something that would just work all the time. So if anybody knows, let me know, and I will be looking on alternative2.net. Wonderful uh, site. Try to find one. Yeah, good stuff. You know, it's funny. I think this probably does happen, where the tips uh, come back to us. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So well, I do get I get email all the time. Say, you know, you really should recommend this yeah, tool or this, yeah. whatever it is, and it's like, well. I, I should. You're right. And and back in September when I did, um, yeah, I guess you weren't listening that day. <laughs> it's pretty funny. <laughs> well, it happens all that. You know, it's okay. I, I, people. Oh can't no, keep... you know, and nobody listens to everything, and so that's why, frankly, I repeat uh, myself constantly. <laughs> right, I do that too, but it's uh, kind of a senile issue. People say um, sometimes because I'll, you know, if it's a story, I might say uh, appropriate story. I might say it on MacBreak Weekly on Windows mm -hmm. Weekly, and on Twit three times in one yeah. week. And, and people say, you're repeating story. yourself, right. but it's a huge story, and different people listen to those shows. I can't leave it out of one show saying, CF Twit. I mean... Right. <laughs> and I'll, I'll get on this show, and I'll have my own little list of things I think we should talk about, but if it's a big enough deal, like something like Chrome OS... Right. I do wonder. I mean, you must talk about this elsewhere. You have certainly. Oh yeah, we on the on the Google show we talked about Chrome OS a lot, but yeah, that doesn't just, but doesn't mean you shouldn't talk about it because you right. have a unique perspective about it. Well, plus it's all yeah. I mean, uh, if you're listening to this because you're a Windows user, right? Uh, you may not listen to a Mac podcast or a a Google podcast or whatever. So, Ken Shepherdson suggests Box.net as a possible solution for your okay. 
I've used Box. Box is okay. Sounds familiar. I bet I've yeah. been there. But... And now, ladies and gentlemen, because we do have to run and go uh, do another show, much as I hate to, let's get our software oh, yes. pick of the week like you haven't so, heard it yet. <laughs> yeah, we can do this quick because we've already mentioned both of them. Yes. So uh, first is Handbrake, which was just mentioned. I, this was new to me. I can't wait to try it out. Point nine four. I did install it and run it, and sure enough, there's a new UI for the subtitles. I'm really excited to test this. Uh -oh. uh, so it's version point ninety four. It's um, Handbrake.fr is where you download that. And the other one is uh, the previously discussed Office 2010 Home and Business Beta with Click to Run. And this comes with Word, Excel, PowerPoint, Outlook, and OneNote 2010. Very good. Very good. As always, our show notes are in the wiki. Uh, you could find out all the links. And Paul, most of this stuff, frankly, Paul's regurgitating from his website. So you really should just go to the website and forget that. I really, show. actually, what I do is record me reading my website. <laughs> and you've and written the I, column. I take a nap. Uh, <laughs> it's a great site. If you're a Windows user, or even if not, you got to read the super site for Windows. WinSuperSite.com. Paul's also news editor of Windows IT Pro, the author of Windows 7 Secrets in bookstores right now. We do put our show notes also online. I, I should mention this. I don't mention it enough on FriendFeed. We have a Twit Conversations room. And it's a great place to go to see all the show notes as they happen. We kind of do live annotations with links and stuff. And people comment. That's where I get a lot of the comments from, that in our chat room. So if you, uh, if you check out friendfeed.com slash twit dash conversations, uh, you'll see the most recent shows with a lot of links and comments. And, and so forth. Another good way to get the information. And if you're watching live, it's always a great way to uh, participate in the show. That and our great chat room, irc.twit.tv. Uh, normally we do this show, we're doing a little early because of Thanksgiving, but normally we record this show Wednesdays at 2 p.m. Eastern Thursday. time. So, I'm sorry, Thursday at 2 p.m. Eastern time. This is Wednesday. Thursday at 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific, um, which is... Uh, 1900 UTC. I've got all screwed up after the daylight savings time. The back old. But uh, well worth well worth tuning in live.twit.tv to watch all the stuff that didn't make it, the stuff that landed on the cutting room floor. Yes, sir. Have a good Thanksgiving. You too. Enjoy your turkey. I will. And uh, we'll see you next time on Windows Weekly.